After they put Blue and Cory to bed, Patricia told Carter everything. I'm not saying it was your imagination, he said, when he'd finished. But you're always keyed up after the meetings. Those are morbid books y'all read in. I want an alarm system, she told him. How would that have helped? He asked. Listen, I promise for the, the next little while I'll make sure I'll be home before dark. I want an alarm system, she repeated. Before we go to all that trouble and expense, let's see how you feel after the next few weeks. She stood up from the end of the bed. I'm going to check on Miss Mary, she told him, and left the room. She checked the deadbolt on the front and back and sun porch doors, leaving the lights on behind her, then went to Miss Mary's room. The room was lit by an orange glow of Miss Mary's nightlight. She moved softly in case Miss Mary was asleep, then saw the nightlight reflecting off her open eyes. Miss Mary, Patricia asked. Miss Mary's eyes cut sideways at her. Are you awake? The sheets moved and Miss Mary Claus struggled out, then ran out of energy and flopped down on her chest without getting where it was she was going. I'm... Miss Mary wetted her lips. I'm... Patricia stepped to the bed railing. She knew what Miss Mary meant. It's all right, she said. The two women stayed like that for a long moment, listening to the hot wind press on the windows behind the drawn curtains. Who's Horty Pickens? Patricia asked, not expecting a reply. He killed my daddy, Miss Mary said, and took the air out of Patricia's lungs. She never heard that name before. Besides which, Miss Mary usually forgot about the people who floated to the surface of her mind seconds after she'd spoken their names. Patricia had never heard her link the person to an importance together. Why do you say that? She asked softly. I have a picture of Horty Pickens, Miss Mary rasped in his ice cream suit. Her ragged voice made Patricia's scarred ear itch. The wind tried to open the hidden windows, rattled the glass, looked for a way in. Miss Mary's hand found some more energy and slithered across the blankets toward Patricia, who reached down and took the smooth, cold hand in her own. How did he know your father? She asked. Before supper, the men and my daddy used to sit on the back porch passing a jar. Miss Mary said. Us children had our supper early and played in the front yard. Then we saw the man in the suit and color of the vanilla ice cream come up the road. He turned into our yard and the man hid their jar because drinking was against the law. This man walked up to my daddy and said his name was Horty Pickens. And he asked if my daddy knew where he could get himself some rabbit split. That what they called my daddy's corn whiskey. Because it could make a rabbit spit in a bulldog's eye. He said he'd been to the Cincinnati train and his throat was dusty and it'd be worth two bits to him to wet it. Miss Lookins, Mr. Lookin brought out the jar and Horty Pickens tasted it. He said he'd from Chicago to Miami and that it was the best corn liquor he'd ever had. Patricia didn't breathe. It had been years since Miss Mary had put this many sentences together. The night Mama and Daddy argued, Horty Pickens wanted to buy some of Daddy's rabbit spit and sell it in Columbia. And Mama said no. It was 10 cent cotton and 40 cent meat back then. Reverend Bunk told us the boil weave had come because there were too many public swimming pools. The government taxed everything from cigarettes to bow legs. But Daddy's rabbit spit made sure we always had molasses on our cornbread. Mama told him that the snake had stuck out his head usually got it chopped off. But Daddy was tired of scratching a living, so he ignored Mama and sold 12 jars of rabbit spit to Horty Pickens. And Hoyt went to Columbia and sold these right quick and came back with 12 more. He sold those too, and soon Daddy had a second still and was gone from the home from sundown to sunup and sleeping all day. Hoyt Pickens sat regular at our table every Sunday, some Wednesdays, and Fridays, too. He told Daddy all the things he should want. He told Daddy he could get more money if he had laid up his rabbit spit in barrels until they turned brown. That meant Daddy had to lay out considerable, and that he wouldn't see his money back for six months until Hoyt took it to Columbia and got paid. For the first time, Hoyt laid a thick stack of bills on the table and we got all got excited. Something sharp tickled in Patricia's palm. Miss Mary was scratching her nails against Patricia's skin, back and forth, back and forth, like incest creeping across the inside of her hand. Soon everything became about rabbit spit. 
Once the sheriff saw what Daddy was doing, he touched him for a taste of the money. Daddy needed other men to work in the stills, and he paid them with scrip while they waited for the rabbit's bit to turn brown. Banks closed faster than you could remember their names, so everyone held on to their money. But Daddy brought a set of encyclopedias and a mangle for the wash, and the men all smoked store-bought cigars when they sat out back. Patricia remembered Keisha. They'd driven the hundreds and fifty miles upstate many times to visit Carter's cousins and Miss Mary when she lived alone. They hadn't been in for a long while, but Patricia remembered the dry land populated by dry people, covered in dust with filling stations, and every crossroad selling evaporated milk and generic cigarettes. She remembered fellow fields and abandoned farms. She understood the appeal of something fresh and clean and green to people who lived in a small, hot place like that. Around then, the Beckham boys went missing, Miss Mary said. Her throat rasped now. He was a pale little redhead thing, six years old, who'd follow anyone anywhere. When he didn't come home for supper, we all went looking. We expected to find him curled up under a pecan tree, but no. Some people said the government inoculation man took him away. Others said that there was a colored gale in the woods who turned white children into stew. She sold as the love spell for a nickel a taste. Some folks said he fell in the river and got carried away. But it didn't matter what they said, he was gone. The next little boy vanished was Avery Dubhouse. He was a tin bucket totter, and Hoyt told everyone he must have fell in the machines at the mill, and the boss lied about it. That stirred up bad feelings between the mill and the farmers. With so much rabbit spit around, tempers ran hot. Men started showing up at church with their arms in slings and bruises on their face. Mr. Beckham shot himself. But we had presents under the tree that Christmas, and Daddy convinced Mama's sweet time were here. In January, her belly got tight and round. I was their only baby who had lived out of three, but now another baby had taken root. They never found Charlie Beckham if the combined salesman hadn't stopped his horse at the moor's old place and seen the water from the pump flow thick with maggots. They had to let the little boy's body sit in the ice house for three days to let all of the water drain before he'd fit in the coffin. Even then, he they had to build an extra wide. While Spitford got both in the corners of Miss Mary's mouth, from Patricia didn't move. She worried that if she did anything to break the spell, the thread might snap. Miss Mary might never speak like this again. That spring, nobody could afford to plant nothing. Miss Mary went on. Nobody had nothing in the ground, so Daddy and Hoyt had to spend big and to bring corn all the way from Rock Hill. And they had all the money tied up in the rabbit spit barrels. The bank didn't care about no script. They started taking everyone's tools and their horses and mules, and no one could do anything. Everyone waited for those barrels. Their little boy goes missing was... Reverend Buck's baby, and the men got together on the back porch, and I heard them speculate through the windows that one person or another, and the jar kept getting passed, and then Hoyt Pickens said that he'd seen Leon Simmons around the Moore farm one night, and I wanted to laugh because only a stranger would say that. Leon was a colored fellow, and something had happened to his head at the war. He sat in the sun outside Miss Early's door. If you gave him candy, he'd played something for you on his spoons and sing. His mother took care of him, and he got the government check. Sometimes he helped people carry packages, and they always paid him in candy. But Hoyt Pickens said Leon liked to wander at night and had been creeping in places he shouldn't. He said this is what happens when people come down from the north and spread ideas in places that weren't ready for them. He said that Leon Sims sat outside Miss Early's door and licked his lips over children and took them to secret places where he sackled his unnatural appetite. More, The more Hoy Pickens talked, the more the men thought he sounded right. I must have nodded off because when I opened my eyes, it was full dark and the backyard was empty. I heard the train pass and a hoot owl carry out into the woods, and I was slipping back into sleep when the land lit up. A crowd of men came in, followed a wagon, and they and they had lanterns and flashlights. They were quiet, but I heard one voice talking loud, giving orders. It was my daddy. 
Next to him stood Hoyt Pickens in his ice cream suit, clothed in the dark. They pulled something off the back of the cart, a big burlap bag they used for picking cotton. And they lifted one end and something followed out wet and black into the dirt. It was Leon, all tied up with rope. The men get, got shovels. They dug a deep hole under the pe- peach tree and dragged Leon to it. He must not have been dead because I heard him call my daddy boss and say, Please, boss, I play you something, boss. And they threw him down into the hole and piled dirt on top of him until his bags got muffled. And after a while, you couldn't hear it anymore. But I still could. When I woke up early, there was mist on the ground. And I went out back to see if maybe I had a bad dream. But I could see the fresh dug dirt. And then I heard noise and saw my daddy sitting real quiet in the corner of the porch. He had a jar of rabbit spit between his legs. His eyes were swollen red, and when he saw me, he gave me a grin and came straight out of hell. Trisha realized this is why Miss Mary let the peaches rot. The memory of the fruit sweet juices running down her chin. It meant filling her stomach now tasted sour with Leon Sims' blood. Hoyt Pickens left before Rabbit Spit turned brown, Miss Mary croaked. Daddy took the wagon to Columbia, but he couldn't find who he'd been buying from Hoyt. All their money was in those barrels. But no one in Cresha could buy the rabbit spit, the price daddy need, and he drank most of it himself over the next few years. Mama lost my brother child, and daddy sold his stills for eating money. He never worked another day, just sat out back drinking the brown rabbit spit alone because no one would come by our place knowing what we'd buried there. When he'd finally hung himself in the barn, it was a mercy. When hard times came a few years later, some people said it was Leon Sims that poisoned the land, but I always knew it was Hoyt. In a long silence, water overflowed Miss Mary's twitching eyelids and ran down her face. She licked her lips. Patricia saw the white film coated her tongue. Her skin looked as thin as paper, and her hands felt cold as ice. Breathing sounded like tearing cloth slowly. Patricia watched her bloodshot eyes lose their focus and realized telling the story had set Miss Mary adrift. Trisha started to pull her hand from Miss Mary's, but the old lady tightened her fingers and held them firm. Night walking men always have a hunger on them, she croaked. They never stop talking and they don't know about enough. They're mortgaged their souls away and now they eat and eat and never know how to stop. Patricia waited for Miss Mary to say something else, but her mother-in-law didn't move. After a while, she pulled her hand from Miss Mary's cold fingers and watched old lady fall asleep with her eyes still open. The black wind pressed down on her house. 